Thank you. You may be seated. All right. Well, it's our delight here to have uh, missionary Bruce Martin with us. He's a veteran missionary. He actually just basically grew up on the mission field. He'll share a little bit of his testimony with us at this hour as well. But uh, looking forward to the message today, and I trust that you come with a heart ready to receive something from God. And uh, Brother Martin, why don't you come and uh, give us the Word of God. Thank you, Brother Warner. appreciate that very much. Well, good morning again. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, this won't be the first time I've been here on other missions conferences, so it's a pleasure to come back and get to know some people and get to uh, share with you again what God has been doing in many ways. Uh, we, during the Sunday school hour, I presented myself a little bit and talked about uh, how I grew up on the mission field. My parents were missionaries in Mexico where I grew up, and uh, I arrived there when I was four years old, and then God uh, called me into the ministry when I was 12. I got saved there at the age of eight. And then uh, I've been a missionary since 1980 out of the Metropolitan Baptist Church of Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, so I feel very much at home here with the same name of the church. But uh, uh, we uh, have felt blessed that over the last 44 years, they have been our sending church. And we've worked in Mexico, Honduras, and now for the last 20 years all throughout Latin America. Uh, I travel a lot. About 60% of the time I'm on the road. I do a lot of flying. In fact, this week has been, my wife and I were in a conference in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Went back to Texas on Thursday. I flew up here yesterday. I go back to Texas tomorrow. On Wednesday, my church starts their missions conference and goes Wednesday through Sunday. Brother Robert Sargent is going to be our guest speaker there for that conference. And then Monday, a week from tomorrow, I fly to Africa to take two men from Mexico. And uh, they're uh, the pastor and his potential missionary a candidate, missionary candidate, to go to uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Malawi. We'll be doing a survey trip through those countries for about three weeks. So uh, I was scheduled initially to be here, I think, next, no, two weeks from today. And the pastor was very kind to change things around. About five, six months ago, we had to make some changes because when this trip began to be planned, uh, I wanted to make sure I get to go with those guys. And it was, it's a very important time for them as... Uh, they are, uh, the churches in Mexico are getting excited about sending missionaries themselves. And uh, let me tell you, uh, we look at it, and I was talking with a pastor here last week, and he was kind of a surprise. He says, oh, can they do that? Uh, wait a minute, it's the same God. <laughs> if he does it for us, can he do it for them? Uh, why are we having this attitude that God cannot do great things? He's a great God. He will do it. And uh, sometimes we in our, uh, this might be a little rough in our pride, thinking our arrogance, thinking only we can do it. Uh, that's not right. Uh, God uh, has a lot more, a lot of things going on that we don't even know about. And I praise him because he is a great God and he can take things that seem impossible to our eyes and do great things with it. And he's been, uh, our, this book is full of that. So why should we be surprised he's not doing it still to this day? So uh, pray with us about it. I'm, I'm getting up there. I'm 68 years old. And so now uh, things are not as easy for me on these trips, uh, going all night on the planes. And then when we get there, uh, the conditions, I, like I was just mentioning a few moments ago, two weeks ago today, I was in Cuba. And uh, conditions there were not good because of lack of electricity. So these situations are the way it is on the mission field somewhat. But I've been doing it all my life. I don't, I'll, I'll continue doing it as long as God gives me the strength to do it. But I appreciate this church for supporting me. And one of the goals that I have in giving these reports is to help you understand that this faith promise that you're giving here, that you're making for this next year, and the giving that you've been doing faithfully toward missions does have some results. Things are happening. And uh, sometimes God is doing some things bigger than what your church is doing here. I showed you some videos of those churches in Mexico. They weren't small churches. God is doing some great things in other places of the world. Great. Uh, you know, uh, I have three children, and one of them is a missionary in Argentina. Uh, the other is my daughter, and her husband worked there in Fort Worth, Texas. He's a fireman. And then my youngest son is in Houston. But your desire is that your children go further than you do, don't, they? don't you? You want them to be more successful than you are. Well, that should be the same thing for a church when it has daughter churches. We want them to be even better than we are. And one of the things about a church is it's not measured on how long it's been in existence or even the attendance that it has, but what is its impact upon the world? 
not just in the area that it's at, but everywhere else too. We see there are 27 different local churches mentioned in the New Testament. Which one of them is probably the most outstanding? Well, some people might think that the church at Jerusalem was the more important one. I don't believe that. I believe the church at Antioch in Syria was the most important of the 27 churches because it got more done. It was the first church that people were called Christians at. It was the first church that sent out Paul as a missionary. It did a lot of firsts. And because of what it did, we're here today. I could say without a doubt that this church here today exists because of what that church at Antioch was willing to do almost 2,000 years ago. Now, I don't know how long our Lord will tarry His coming, but whatever it is, I want to be as faithful as I can to Him today. And I trust that your church has a goal of having a lasting ministry. Now, the church at Antioch in Syria is not in existence today. Those churches, none of them of the 27 are in existence today. A church has a limited life, if you think, think about it. The question is not how long it lives, but what it's doing while it's serving God. There are great men of God that didn't live long lives. Stephen had a very short ministry, but the ministry he had was very impactful. It's not how long you exist, it's what you're doing when God is using you. And that's our greatest desire. So let's go to Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to talk about that theme just a little bit this morning. And you know, in the Bible, there's a lot of analogies. The Lord likes to compare things, and our Lord Jesus Christ taught that way with parables and many other things. He compares us to a sheep, for instance. Where are the sheep of his fold? In John chapter 10, he talks about he is the great shepherd, and we are his sheep. And you can take that analogy and study it in great detail. And there's a lot of spiritual truth and a lot of learning we can get as we study what sheep do. I was in Ireland back in July and we went to a sheep farm. And I was talking there with the sheep farmer and I was really interested about some things. And he was talking about wool. He says it's worthless today. With the new ways of doing fabric and the synthetics and things like that. He says, the value of wool has plummeted so much that it costs me more to shear the sheep than the wool I get out of it. Now, there are certain wools that are high value, like merino wool, things like that, that might be worth it. But the common sheep, it doesn't really have that much value. You think, well, what's going on? But there's something else that he taught me that was very interesting. Sheep cannot live in the wild. It's one of the few animals in the world that we've domesticated they cannot live by, without a human care, if you ever think about it. And one of the reasons is sheep have to be sheared. If you let a sheep go out in the wild, and sometimes they've left, and they might live for a while, but eventually that wool gets so long and so thick and so full of trash and, and other stuff and mud and things like that, that it gets so heavy that the animal can't get up and it will die. It has to have the help of a human being to survive. Well, we are compared to sheep too because we need our Lord. We can't survive without Him. Now, the other animals like dogs and cats, and they can go out in the wild and horses, cattle. They can survive without a problem, but not sheep. That's why God chose the sheep. It's a very interesting thing. But another analogy that the Lord used in the parable of the sower was seed. And that's what I'd like to talk about this morning. Now, I'm planning a different type of message this evening. We're going to go into Genesis and talk about missions in Genesis. You might think, well, that's way too early. Missions is part of the New Testament. No, you'll find missions throughout the whole Bible. But this morning, I want to talk about the importance of the sowing and reaping. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Our entire life depends on this system that God has designed of sowing and reaping, of seeds. I can remember when I was young and we were studying the Bible and I was beginning to hear some of the apologetics, the arguments about how the creation had to be a true thing. And uh, there was a time... When some people were trying to propose that the seven days of creation were literal seven days, that they were uh, actually periods of long distance time. Of course, they, what they were trying to do was to try to satisfy the evolutionists with a long uh, 
period of time that they're requiring and saying that in the Bible that long period of time occurred during the creation, which wasn't, wasn't literal seven days, but seven periods. But you study that and you got some problems because when God created some things, first of all, he created the plants before he created the sun. Now, plants can't survive without the sun. So it's got to be literal for 24-hour days. Otherwise, in other words, we're so interdependent, everything that God created had to be done pretty quickly. Otherwise, everything would have fallen apart. And one of those things is this principle of the sowing and the reaping. Because life would not exist if this principle didn't apply here on earth. Now, he takes those very principles of the sowing and reaping and he wants to apply it to our own life. Now, there are six parables that the Lord Jesus Christ taught in the New Testament that have to do with, with planting. One, of course, was the more famous one, the parable of the sower. We know that there, the seed went out and there were different types of soil and how that seed fell on different types of soil. But then there's also the, um, the uh, parable of the wheat and the tares. And that's where bad seed gets mixed up with the good seed. And the weeds come up with the good stuff. And then there's also the uh, parable of the mustard seed. And that is a parable about faith. And how a very small seed contains so much information and so much potential that it becomes a great thing. And then there's also the parable of the workers in the vineyard and how they are taking that vineyard and planting it and working with it and becomes a great harvest. But then there's also another parable of the bad workers in the vineyard and how they had to be punished. And then also there is also a parable of the, of the growth of the seed in Mark chapter 4 and verse 26. Let's go look at that one real quickly because that's not a very well-known one. But Mark chapter 4... And verse, uh, Mark, Mark chapter uh, 4 and verse 26. Mark 4, 26. He said, and he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring up and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first blade in the ear, and after that the, the full corn on the ear, but when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Now this is a very short parable, and you don't hear it preached much, but it's also the basis for this concept of sowing and reaping. It's a very important one. And the reason that I want to bring this out during your missions month is that that's exactly what we're trying to get done here. It's a principle of sowing, of planting a seed. And there's a lot of different principles when we begin to study this. And I enjoy studying the parables because, uh, and you get carried away. And I remember uh, when I first took a lesson, a class on the parables, uh, we were taught, be careful, don't go too far into them. You don't really have doctrine there in the parables. It has a central reason for giving a parable and you should always stay within that. Because if you start going out field from there, you get into trouble some ways. But this very important principle is very evident in that when we're sowing, it's because we expect to have a harvest. You expect to have results. And right now, during the time of sowing, it's not an easy time. Now, both of my grandparents were farmers. And my parents grew up on farms. Um, during the time that I was growing up, we had some farms during a certain period of time. Uh, there was about two or three years where my father rented a big farm where we had a Bible institute. And the students there in Mexico were working the farm. We had animals. I, I raised pigs right before I went to college. And I paid for some of my college years by raising pigs. And so I have some, uh, a little bit of familiarity with what it's like to be on a farm and the, 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 the planting of seeds and having a garden and things like that. So uh, this was a, a, something that I, I kind of understand. Uh, and some of you, I'm sure, have had past that you can give some of that same witness. And if many of you, even though you might live in the city, might want to have a garden. Now, my, my wife has a green thumb and she has plants all over the house. And sometimes I get frustrated. 
Because in our, uh, our main master bathroom, we have both a, a tub and also a shower. Now, we don't use the tub much. We use the shower pretty much. So what has my wife done with the tub? Well, it's become the depository for plants. It's got plants all over. Of course, that keeps the bathroom nice and, and, and pretty, you know, humid and stuff. But uh, she has them all over the place. And sometimes I try to walk out the door and there's always in the way or outside the door. Our front door, you walk up and it's getting to be narrower and narrower because she's planting more stuff there. You know how that is. But she enjoys having plants around. But there's some principles here that I want to bring out this morning that I think will be very important. Number one, seed that is stored will go to waste. You can't, now, yes, there are seeds that have been stored for many years. They're finding seeds that are a thousand years old and been able sometimes to grow them again. But a farmer knows that he doesn't want old seed. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not a possibility that some of those seeds will germinate. But as a whole, you want fresh seed every year. If you go into a hardware store where they're selling seeds, you're very careful that when you're buying those packets of seeds that we use in your garden, is the is fresh seed. It's four or five years old. You don't want it. Why? Because a lot of them are out of, will not, will not grow. In Luke chapter 12, we find this principle. Luke chapter 12 and verse 16, we find the principle that, uh, and, and basically what, it, what I'm trying to say is, we shouldn't leave the seed in the barn. It doesn't do any good when it's there. And a lot of times we have this attitude if we're not careful, well, let's store up, let's set aside for a rainy day. And yes, that is a principle that is taught in the Word of God, but it's a limited thing. You don't store it and you don't overdo it either. But the goal is that you're going to save that so that eventually you will plant it. If you never plant it, it's, it's a waste. So in Luke chapter 12 and verse 16, we read, And he spake a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will, there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall these things be which thou hast provided? The concept here is that we should not just save up for our own pleasure. The reason this man was doing all this is because he felt like he would have security if he saved all these things up. Now, I understand. I, I, I think that being frugal and saving is a biblical principle. I think that we should live without debt. I think that we should provide for our own, and we should have something laid up. I'm not against that. But you can overdo it, too. You can get to the point where you're saying, and I've known churches that have reserves that are tremendous, but they don't do anything for the Lord. That's not the goal here. You're going to be putting together a plan for this next year. One of the reasons we use Faith Promise is just not, to, not only to motivate you to be involved in missions, but also that this church can make plans for the future year. And what we're going to do is, we're not going to say, oh, let's put all this money in the bank, let it accumulate so we're sitting pretty for a long time. No, the goal is, what can we use this money for as soon as we can? And missions is a type of offering that's totally different. Your tithes are used for this building, for the electricity, for the maintaining, for paying your pastor, things like that. It, you, as you tithe, you get a benefit from it. If you're sitting here comfortable, it's because you have given to God an offering, and that, com that offering is being used for your comfort. The seats that you're sitting in are comfortable. But when you get to missions, you're not getting any benefit directly from it yourself. Now, there is a spiritual benefit. I can get into a lot of that. That's a big study in itself. But basically, it's going to go out and others are going to receive the benefit. And we do that willingly, because we know that's God's commandment. But we're also realizing that sometimes we're planting a seed 
that will also eventually come back. And, and, I, and toward the end of our me- my message, I want to come across there because sometimes we don't realize that the reason our nation is a great nation, the reason our relationships with other nations is good, sometimes is because what we've done in t- taking the gospel to those people. It's a very important thing. But when you've got the, the, the seeds saved up, when you put everything in the barn, as this man did, and just say, okay, I'm going to keep it there for, for, for when I'm really, uh, so I can have security. And then all of a sudden you realize that that security that you expected to have is lost. And that happened here recently. We saw what happened with COVID, right? We had great security and all of a sudden it was lost. Within a few weeks, everybody was thinking, it's, we don't have the security we thought we have. We don't have the health we thought we have. This nation has gone through many situations like that. It's been attacked multiple times. Back on December 7th, 1941, that was a surprise attack. September 11th. And when those things happen, everything that we've built and the security we think that we've had with our, with our uh, military and all these other systems that we have put, put together sometimes fall apart. Ask the people right now in North Carolina after that hurricane, all the insurance and everything else they had didn't do them one bit of good. Because really, when it comes down to it, our security is not in what we save up, it's in the Lord. We need to learn how to depend upon Him. So when we have all this stuff saved up, eventually, we'll lose it. Now, we're talking about seed. What happens when it's in the barn? Well, the insects are going to eat it up. Every farmer, that's the biggest concern he's got when he's trying to save up his seed. What's going to happen if the bugs get into it? And I've seen that happen. I remember stuff I saved up and I would go back and about six months later and say, okay, we're going to, I, well, I, had, I remember I raised hogs and I had some corn and some other stuff I'd saved up. I got in there and man, the bugs had gotten into it and it was worthless. Or remember seed, when you plant it, it has potential. Well, if you leave it too long, that potential is gone. When you plant it, nothing comes up. It's lost its strength. Or sometimes, because it's been stored for too long, when it does germinate and produce plants, they're not the best of plants. They're not strong. Because it's been there for too long. And that's, another, that's the reason that when we uh, are very careful, that we, uh, what we have, let's put it out. My father was a big believer in this. He didn't really plan much for his retirement. Now, you can go too far on this. There's a balance. But I saw how God took care of him even when that the time come. First of all, the churches were very faithful. They're always, he lived by faith. But even on the medical field, here in America, we got to worry about what's coming up. And I'm, I'm 68. I can uh, understand, you know, Medicare or some other type of health plan. My father never put anything into that. When he was on the mission field, he didn't have to. So when he was about to come back to the States and he was already in his elderly years, he did not have Medicare. He never qualified for it. And everyone thought, well, this is horrible. Well, where he lived there in Temple, Texas, there was a big hospital system that's very famous around the world called Scott and White Hospital. People around the world go to it. And so he went to them and said, I don't have any money. I'm, I'm indigent, so to speak. So they said, well, we have a special system for people like you and ended up having a better care than if you had been on Medicare. God took care of him. He learned that God will do the best. Sometimes we have to get to that point to saying, I can do what I can, but eventually God has to do and depend upon him. And that's what was the need there. But there's another thing. A seed is no good unless it has good soil to put in. The soil is important. Now, I won't take the time to read it, but Matthew chapter 13 is the parable of the sower. And it talks about the different types of soil, rocky soil, soil that's full of thorns, uh, hard soil, good soil, all the different kinds. But let me, I want you to notice that that sower put seeds in all kinds of soil. He didn't just plant in the good soil. Now, as a farmer, I I feel like, well, okay, I don't want to waste it. But sometimes you just have to do what you, you use, you use the soil you have. Ever thought of that? I've been around the world, and of course I work a lot in Latin America, and some of the places where their farmers are working is pretty bad soil. 
So they're going to, so do you think, well, this oil is just too bad, so we're not going to do anything? No, they use what they've got. You plant where you're at. Here in America, if we work around, and I was asked this question before the Sunday school started this morning about what are the rougher countries in Latin America of reaching the gospel and stuff like that. And I said, well, Argentina is one, for instance. My son's a missionary there. Argentina is a different type of country from the rest of Latin America. Very European. You all have been there. You know what it's like. Some of you all made the trip there when they had the Youth Olympics. And the, the reaction to people to passing out of tracks is very different in Argentina than it is, for instance, in Mexico. The people of Mexico very readily. They won't accept it. It's, it's open. There in Argentina, we would find trash cans full of the tracks. They throw them away. Their reaction was totally different. So let's say, okay, then we're not going to plant anything in Argentina because they just don't want it. No, we're going to still do it. It doesn't matter the soil. You still have to plant in every place that you can. You use the soil that God gives you. And even here, in this area of Minnesota, it can be rough sometimes. I know it. But what do you do? You plant where God puts you. You take advantage of the soil. And even though you might have some loss when you put it in bad soil, there's still that seed sometimes will, all, will have a way of finding that little bit of good soil and take advantage of it. Yeah, some of it might not be used. But what happens is even though a lot of it's lost, that little bit, those few seeds that do find a good place, eventually the fruit they give you is greater than what you lost. And the scripture there talks about it, that parable. You have 20, 50, even 100 times more than you plant. In fact, it's a lot more than that in some situations. You plant one seed of corn and you'll get hundreds and hundreds of kernels of corn. Some of them, different, different things, uh, different results depending on the type of seed. But still, you always have a lot more than you plant. And that's one of the principles of the sowing and reaping, is you're always going to get more than you plant. But there's a third thing. And let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's a very important thing. Because remember, we're talking about in Missions Month, putting out the seed. Giving God what is His so it can be planted. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 36 says, Thou fool, thou, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. For the seed to produce fruit, what does it have to do? Give itself up. Now, it's really interesting how God created seeds and the concept behind them. You've got within that seed, that germ or that item, or that part of it that will give actually birth to the plant. But really the majority of that seed is not that. What that seed has is nutrition for that future plant, for the germ that's going to start that. And the actual germ is a very small part of the seed. But the rest of the seed is there so that what? It will feed that initial part, that initial birth of that plant. It provides that nutrition it needs before it can be start producing its own nutrition through putting out the roots, putting a, getting the, the, the leaves out so it's receiving the sunlight, all that's involved for a plant to exist. But that seed then, what it's doing is it's giving itself up. It's sacrificing itself for the future of that plant. And that's really what God is expecting from us too. He expects us, because that's what our Lord Jesus Christ did to provide us with the salvation. He had to give himself up as a seed, so to speak, and give everything he had so that when he died on the cross and paid for our sin... He gave himself so that we, now we could have salvation. And that example sometimes is we need to do the same thing. In other words, you don't plant a seed and then come back and say, okay, I'm going to after he started the plant, I'm going to recover that seed back again so I go and plant it somewhere else. 
No, the seed's gone. It's lost. When you're giving to missions, one of the concepts of giving an offering, and this is a very important concept, sometimes we forget this. And as you're a member of this church, remember, when you're giving an offering, you're basically saying goodbye. Because I'm giving control of that away from myself. If I still want to control it after I give it, I really haven't given it. Trying to stay, keep, keep in control means you don't really want to give it up. So when I give an offering, and does it happen sometimes? Are offerings given to churches misused? Yes. Are there unethical people sometimes in churches? There are. Will that happen? It's going to happen. And some people, because of that, say, okay, well, I'm not going to be involved anymore because that was a bad experience. But wait a minute. It wasn't yours to be worried about. Once you give it to God, it's God's. And He's the one who's responsible for taking care of it. As I've traveled and been on the mission field all my life, you are concerned about security constantly. And it's not that you don't take steps to protect yourself. And I was talking with Doug Hammett, who's a missionary in South Africa, about this trip I'm about to take. And he was telling me about some of the dangers. And I was thinking about when I got to Zimbabwe, since I wasn't familiar with it, I didn't know the roads or anything like that. I said, well, maybe I can find a, a vehicle that will have, I can rent the vehicle, but it includes a driver. And Brother Doug says, no, no, you don't want to do that. I says, why? You can't trust the drivers. They will be, I says, so what do I do? He says, you rent the car and you drive it yourself. It's very dangerous to do it that way. I said, okay, thanks for the tip. <laughs> Little things like that. Are, I didn't do that in Nepal. Now, let me tell you, when I was in Nepal, I was very glad to have a driver because they drive crazy there. I've driven all over the world, but I've never seen driving like you see in India and Nepal. It's the worst driving you've ever, you cannot even imagine. And let me tell you, I have driven in Thailand, I've driven all over the world, but those countries, and yeah, there I, I hired a driver because it was pretty bad. <laughs> but the concept we have here is that when you're uh, worried about all these things, if, you're con if you can, be can become so concerned about protecting yourself, you get to a point, even as a missionary, you don't get anything done. And you have to get to a point of saying, look, it's in God's hands. Because it's not really mine. My son has a vehicle he purchased there in Argentina. It's a pickup. It's a Toyota pickup. And yeah, he put some security features on there. There's a lot of problems with crime there. But eventually you have to get to the point of saying, it's God's vehicle. If they steal it, they're stealing God's vehicle. It's not mine. People are concerned about when I go to Cuba. And they say, oh, Cuba, very dangerous place. It's not really. Most totalitarian governments, the crime is not that bad because they control so much. And in Cuba, I have not seen hardly any crime. But you're concerned about the government. Oh, the government's going to do something to you. And my response to all that is, well, wait a minute. If that's where God wants me, that's the safest place I can be. You ever thought of that? Ask Jonah about this. Jonah decided not to be in God's will, and what had happened to him? He got swallowed by a big fish. Then he realized, no, the safest place for me to be is in Nineveh, even though that was a dangerous place. They were the enemies of God's people. So if we're doing what God wants us to do, yeah, sometimes there might be some dangers, but we have to understand, this is God's problem. And even though I'm worried about it, I have to give it over to Him sometimes. Another thing about the seed that we're, when, it, when it dies is this. You can't eat the seed and then turn around and plant it. It's going to be one or the other, right? One of the things that happened during the Depression and really rough times here in our nation was farmers always had to have set aside their seed, their, their seed crop, or their, the part of their crop that is set aside for seeds. And even if they were starving to death almost, they could not eat that. Why? Because that was the future. If you ate up everything, there was nothing to plant. You definitely were going to starve. So you had to have the discipline and the understanding that whatever set aside for seed has to be used for that. You can't eat it. You can't use it for your own benefit. It has to be used for God's benefit. And there's another principle about the sowing and the reaping. And that is, it takes time to see the results. We just read there in Mark chapter 4. Now, uh, 
if you're a little child and you've heard about planting and seeds and stuff like that, you might have gone out and planted a little, let's say a bean. You take a bean, you're going to plant it, and you plant it there, and the next day you come up and say, well, what happened? Where's the plant? Well, of course, that's ridiculous, because it's not going to happen overnight, is it? It takes time. I remember when I first started doing a little bit of a garden, my father said, well, if you're impatient, the best thing I can recommend to you is plant radishes. Said, Why is that? He said, they're the quickest ones to bring fruit. You'll have something in less than a month. But there are some things that if you want them, you will have to wait years and years. You know, they're, in fact, the bigger the, 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 the plant, the longer it's going to take. I had a friend who had an avocado grove. He says, well, it takes us about five years from the time we plant the seed until we start getting fruit. In my backyard, I have a, 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 a peach tree. I like peaches. Well, I planted it, but I didn't get any peaches the first two, three years. It took me about four years before. Last year, we finally got a good crop. <laughs> but I knew it was going to take a while, doesn't it? Those, whenever you plant, it's going to take a while before you see the results. One of the things that it concerns me, and I have to deal with a lot when I'm visiting you know, churches in the U.S. and we're talking about mission work, is the emphasis on quick results. I'll have pastors ask me, well, how many people did you have saved? I want to I wanna see something quickly. And this is even more true when you're involved in Bible translation. I work a lot in Bible translation. In fact, right now, there are the Indian tribes in Mexico, they've been working about eight years on translating the New Testament. We have three different languages just recently done. About a month ago, I was in Milford, Ohio, talking to the First Baptist Church of Milford, Ohio, about printing these New Testaments. And we're getting ready toward the end of the year to have them done. But it takes a while. But there's something about this. This job, this project that we're doing, we realize is just a, really a small step toward getting a good Bible. Because the men who did this translation do not know Greek. They're translating from Spanish to the Indian language. That's not the best thing. The best thing is go from Greek, because that's how the New Testament was written, into the Indian but no one who speaks this Indian dialect knows Greek. Now, we're starting to teach some Greek classes. Some of them are starting to understand it. Maybe 20, 40 years from now, we might have some of these Indian preachers that know enough Greek to translate directly from the Greek to their Indian language, but it's going to take a while. Do you realize that the same thing that happened with our English Bible? Our first translation in English was done by John Wycliffe. It was done in the late 1300s, the 14th century. 1380, more or less. Between then and when we got the King James Bible in 1611, you're looking at over 200 years. And in that time, there were seven different translations. That's the process that you have to go through to get a good translation. It doesn't happen overnight. But then some people, when we go to a mission field and say, well, we're working on a translation, well, you've got to have a perfect one right away. It doesn't work that way. You have to be patient. It won't happen in my lifetime. But I know that God is going through the process. And we have to be patient. It's the same thing in anything you want to do for the Lord. It doesn't happen always quickly. One of the biggest problems I had when I was a young missionary was I wanted to get to the field as quick as I wanted. I couldn't wait. And I made some mistakes. I went down there too early. I didn't have enough in income. My family was not ready. I had a daughter who was just a month old. There was a lot of things. My family paid a high price because of my impatience. I've learned over the years that sometimes God does take His time. But sometimes the longer it takes, the better the fruit. You saw some reports I gave during Sunday school, what's going on. You saw the size of the, that one church and other churches and how God's doing some great things. But you know, that has been 60 years in the making. Some people see that and they want results like that right now. It doesn't work that way. It takes a very long time and sometimes generations. That's why the Lord was talking about the sins of the fathers will visit it to the children to the third and fourth generation. Well, you can flip that and say the, the virtues and the faithfulness of the fathers will also visit their children to the third and fourth generation. And so sometimes what you're doing today is planting a seed that your great-grandchildren are going to be harvesting. That's why it's so important to be faithful to the Lord. You have to learn patience. If you don't learn patience, 
you're not a good farmer. Both of my grandfathers told me about that. And here's another thing. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 16. Matthew 7, 16. And this is a very important principle. It seems like very obvious. It's a very simple point, but think about it. You're going to reap the same thing that you plant. You want to plant watermelons and harvest peaches, and nothing going to work. <laughs> Matthew 7, 16 says, You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Now, what that really means is, what are you planting today? What kind of seeds are you planting? If you're not planting the good stuff, why do you expect to harvest the good stuff? There's bad seeds and there's good seeds. This principle of sowing and reaping applies to everything we do. It's not just being involved in missions. It involves every aspect of your life. And when you're planning these things, eventually you're going to sow. One of the things that a preacher or a pastor really has a broken heart about is as he's working with the people in the church and he's seeing their lives and he's seeing them sowing certain things it hurts him because he knows what they're going to reap eventually. And you try to tell them, say, oh no, it's not going to happen to me. I'm exempt. I'm different. No, you're not. And if you're sowing something that's going to be bad, it's going to always be pretty rough. Don't expect to sow a worldly life and then reap a spiritual benefit. It doesn't work that way. If you live a life of carnal pleasure, do not expect then to live a late life of spiritual blessings. Now, sometimes God is good. And sometimes when we realize we've done that and we confess it to Him, He will give us a blessing. But there will still be some effects of that. There are three different consequences of sin. When you sin... There are consequences that are physical, there are consequences that are emotional or mental, and there are consequences that are spiritual. Just like we are three-part individuals, there are also three consequences of sin. When I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, the spiritual consequences of my sin were taken away, but not the physical ones. If a man has been an alcoholic all his life, had problems with that, late in life he gets saved, he confesses his sin. God saves him miraculously and gloriously. He leaves the, the, the drink. He con conquers that problem. But does he get a new liver? No. He will probably suffer because of that life. The physical consequences of that. Spiritually, he's been forgiven. But he will still suffer that. Man likes to go carousing, goes into bars, things like that. And he gets into a fight and they cut off a finger. He gets saved. Will he get a new finger? Of course not. He'll have to suffer the consequences of that because that is the physical consequences of sin. So you're still going to reap what you sow in that area. We never should remember that. Here, the principle that was given to us is you don't plant weeds and expect to, to harvest grapes. You know, Unbelievers are always surprised when finally their sin catches up to them. I see this all the time. Oh, I never thought it was going to be this bad. The world tells us, oh, live for today, don't worry about tomorrow. Well, tomorrow eventually comes. Then you find out, well, it's going to be pretty rough. But here's something else, another principle. You always reap more than you sow. There in Matthew chapter 13 in the parable of the sower, it talks about 20, 50, 100 fold, a lot more. No farmer expects to plant one seed and reap one seed. It'd be a waste. It's a lot of work. You expect to have re return on your investment, so to speak. You don't expect to go to a bank and put your money in a savings account and five years later they give you the exact same amount back. You think that's a waste. You expect a profit. 
you expect an increase. And with farming, the increase can be pretty drastic, can be pretty big. But wait a minute. This applies in both areas. Because remember, you can plant for good things and plant for bad things. So if you plant for the Lord, and a lot of times I've seen this happen, and I thank the Lord that in my family, uh, not just myself with my children, but also my brothers and sisters, uh, my parents planted well. So I have a family that's involved in missions. My younger, I'm the oldest of the, of the five. I have a younger sister who's a year younger than I am. She and her husband are missionaries in Guatemala for 25 years, and about five years ago they moved to Peru. They've been working there now in Peru for a while. In fact, I'll be going there in December for a graduation there for the, some of our people from our college. Um, uh, they have a son who's a missionary there in Peru also. He married a Peruvian girl, and they've been working there for about 10 years. My son is in Argentina. I have a brother who's in evangelism. I have uh, uh, other nephews that are also serving the Lord. Uh, we have a big family that's involved in missions. And I thank the Lord for that. But who planted that seed? My parents. In fact, it wasn't just my parents. I am a fourth generation preacher. My great grandfather was a Baptist pastor. So I have my great grandfather, my grandfather, my father, and myself. My son is fifth generation in our family to be a Baptist preacher. That's a wonderful legacy. I thank the Lord for it. But you know what happened? A, grandfa a great grandfather I never knew planted the seed. That's where it started. And now I'm reaping the benefits. So think about what you're planting right now. This is not just about missions. This is about life. You want your family to have those benefits. And you want that good fruit. You don't plant good seed and get bad results. But you don't plant bad seed and get good results either. It works always consistently. The biggest thing we need to understand is God wants us to be planting for Him. My prayer is this church takes this month and realizes this is a very important month. Because this is the month that you're going to start planting a seed. Planting for the, the future of this church is determined by sometimes this month. Because really, the existence of the church is not so that you can have a good time. It's not a social thing. It's not for you to uh, just have something to do on the weekends. The purpose of a church is to take the gospel to the rest of the world. That's your whole reason for existing. Why are you here this morning listening to me? I hope that you're taking what I'm giving you and then use it for God's glory. If you're taking it and never using it, it's a waste of the seed. But I want to plant that seed for you, just as you should be planting seeds for God too. You being used of the Lord so that this can happen, and if God tarries, and the Lord Jesus Christ tarries His coming, it will happen in generations from us. You know, the cost of not doing it can be pretty high. The cost of not serving the Lord can be pretty high. And I was planting the bad seed. Now, when you look at the bad seed, you say, well, being sinful or doing other... No, it can be something as simple as neglect. You know, there's a story there in England about 200 years ago. Besides the main part of Great Britain, you know, there's a lot of small islands around it that are part of that empire. And one of those on the western side is called the Isle of Man. I don't know if you've heard of it or not. Between Great Britain and Ireland. And that island had a governor that was falsely accused of treason against the king. He was put on trial, deemed to be guilty, and sentenced to death. About three or four days before the sentence was going to be carried out, the king of England discovered that the man was innocent. And when he discovered that, he immediately wrote out a pardon and sent it over there to the island. But he made a mistake, the king did. He gave the pardon to a messenger who was the enemy of the governor. You know what the messenger did? He didn't hurry. He took his time. When he arrived to, the, uh, to give the pardon there in the island of man, the governor had already been executed. You know what they did? They put the messenger on trial for murder. Because he had the message of salvation and didn't give it to him in time. 
It's the same with us. God has given us a great responsibility. Even by, by doing nothing, we're planting a seed. We're not doing what we should do. God wants us to be active in His ministry. And you don't get it done by keeping the seed of the barn, by sitting around. You do it by being involved. And the goal of this time of this month is getting everybody here involved in serving the Lord. Going out and talking to your neighbors, talking to people around you, witnessing to them, being involved in missions, making a trip. I did not know about it. I just heard about it a few moments ago. Y'all are planning a trip to Zambia. That's right next to where I'm going. A rough area. You'll have some exciting times. God's going to do something. Y'all just had a trip to, to, to France, I know, with the Olympics there. Things, I can talk about a lot of other things. This church has got a lot of projects and plans. You're planting the seed. How much are you involved in it? Father, I thank you so much for the privilege of coming before this church this morning and seeing the principle of the sowing and reaping, of planting a seed. I pray that this church might have great harvest, that you might use them in a mighty way. But we know that this time right now is the biggest important part of preparation for that harvest. May you touch the hearts that they might be involved in getting the word out around the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's quietly stand to our feet with every head bowed and every eye closed. The pianists are both play here. Man, it's a lot of rich things spoken of today. I want to really encourage you and I to really take some time to really consider what we're sowing in our life. You know, are we making that commitment to the Lord? Is there something that are we holding back? Boy, like he said, the decisions that we make in this month are going to impact not only this church, but the world, really. Yes, it's, yeah, we, we talk about giving, and that, that is certainly an aspect, but boy, the things that he talked about address every area of life. Some people are so mad about where they're at in life, but, but we are the sum of our decisions, folks. Say, I don't like what, where I'm at right now. Well, guess what? You can change some of that. Start, if you sowed some bad seeds, start sowing some good seed. Now, it takes time. But sometimes that good seed can override the bad seed. Maybe not 100%, but I tell you, you keep sowing bad seeds, you're just going to get things worse. This is going to be worse. Many aspects of life are, are talked about today. But it is our emphasis this month on missions. Somebody well put it this way, we plant trees that we don't sit under. And we're planning for another generation even at times. We, we are a link in the chain throughout the, the annals of time. We are the benefactors in many ways of the sacrifices of other people. Many people we haven't even met. I was thinking about what he said there about his great grandfather being a Baptist preacher and, and the faithfulness that, and the impact of that decision to be, remain faithful to the Lord. I tell you something, there are enough people in our day and age that are pulling away because it's a lot easier to live for themselves and live for their lusts, but it, it has long-term consequences that extend beyond our lives. Make your choices wise, Christian. May we, may we plant right. May we plant right. May God help us today with the decisions that we make in this country in this regard. Father, we're thankful today for the message and the challenge and just the wisdom, Lord God, that, uh, that was given to us today from your word. I pray that we would really grab a hold of that and, and really consider the decisions we're making this month with, with missions, with even local evangelism here that we do. Help us realize that nothing is ever in vain if we do it in the, for the Lord. And I pray that we would be more inspired, more active, more uh, involved than ever before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate that so much. Wonderful channel. A lot of meat in there, to the things to contemplate on. Again, not just with missions, really all of life. We've got to be conscious of some of the things that we're sowing. I'm sure we've all sowed some bad seed, but if we can sow as much good seed as we can in life, and in particular with the things of the Lord, 
It makes such a difference in not just our lives, but in successive generations. And uh, we, have to be, have, we have to have that kind of long view when it comes to these types of things. So be prayerful. Let God lead you to what he wants you to do in giving and in your participation in the Great Commission. He wants every creature reached. So you and I have a responsibility to do our part the best that we can under his guidance, and he'll take care of it from there. Well, tonight at 6.30, we'll be back and uh, looking forward to hearing a message once again. I really encourage you to be back. I think it'll be a challenge to you and, and an inspiration in many ways as he talks about missions. Really, it's, it's been always God's plan of getting the message of redemption to the world, and each of us plays a part in that. So I encourage you to be back for that tonight. Neil, why don't you come?